in this church to be able to share from God's Word. Uh, been here so many times, all of you just like family, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I was talking to Brother Charlie, I guess, either the last time or time before, I forget which, uh, when we were here last, and um, he said, put it on your schedule, and uh, we want you to come and preach a revival meeting for us, and uh, he said, before I retire, I want you to come back and preach. So I don't know if I'm preaching his retirement message tonight, <clears throat> if I'm supposed to tell everybody that everything I know about you or what. No, okay, well, I'm going to anyway, thank God, <laughs> no, it, it's always good to be back here, and I love Brother Charlie, and I know you all do as well, but I'm looking forward to what God has in store for their lives as they move on to the next stage of their opportunity for ministry as, as well. But he did say to me, now be sure you preach revival sermon, and so I'm going to talk about revival tonight. In fact, you may not be happy when we're done, because revival no, is not a happy time. It's a time for us to stop and look inwardly. And be upset with the way we are. And praying that maybe God will do something in our life to make a difference in our life. So many opportunities and that would come to preacher's way to come preach revival meeting. And it really just is a meeting. It's a time we just come and we got great music. Everybody high fives, feel good about ourselves. Man, what a sermon that was and... We turn around and leave and nothing, nothing ever changes. This is not going to be one of those. You may not, uh, you may tell Brother Trevor and Brother Charlie, let's don't let him come back for a little while. <laughs> he steps way too much on our toes. But when I share with you tonight, it is from my heart, helping us to understand what God's plan is for each of us as believers. There's a few things that I'll share with you tonight. I'll do what I don't like to do, and that's repeat myself. My wife knows that when I preach, I like to say it one time. Y'all ought to get it. We're moving on to something else. Amen. Can I get a witness? <laughs> but I'm going to uh, say a few things more than once tonight just to be able to nail that point home with you. One of those is going to be something like this. You ought not be praying for revival unless you're willing to be revived. There's a lot of folks that, that I see on Facebook says we need to be praying for revival in America. And we ought to, I guess, to some extent, but if you're not willing to be revived, your prayers are, are truly in vain. There's no value for you begging that God's going to do something in Washington, D.C. if you don't want God to do something in Finley Baptist Church. Because revival for us does not start somewhere else, it starts right here. When you point your finger over yonder, remember how many fingers you got coming back to yourself. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And we're going to lay it out before God that this is either going to be just another one of those meetings or we genuinely want God to do something in, in and through our lives. I hope it's going to be the latter of the two. And I hope that as we finish our time together, Brother Charlie said that uh, I could preach up until about 7.15. I could preach longer after that, but y'all are going somewhere else to eat or whatever else. <laughs> and I know that he was somewhat kidding. I preached at a church this morning, and, and I guess I went longer than they were accustomed to. Of course, you know, I'm accustomed to preaching a long time. I was in Africa... Sometime back, started preaching at 10 o'clock and got through at 12 midnight. They were all upset that I was stopping so early. <laughs> Many years ago, I was in Eastern Europe in a country and started early that morning. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I finally said to them, Listen, if you'll let me lay down, I can preach laying down, I promise. They were so hungry, and when we ended, they, I said, Well, what are y'all going to do if I lay down? They said, We're going to sit right here and talk about all the things you shared with us today. Oh, how we have become desensitized to the moving of the Holy Spirit of God. And we have just allowed ourselves to say to preachers, just give us a little sermonette. 20 minutes will be good. 
When I was in seminary, one of the professors said, only give as much as the, and y'all forgive me in advance, the rear end can endure. And it's unfortunate that we can endure a four-hour football game, but we can't endure a 30-minute sermon. Okay, the preachers are getting this. The rest of y'all, I'm not sure. <laughs> Let me help you just a moment. And you may be a little nervous. If we say amen, he might preach longer. <laughs> but all amen means is two things. Number one, for Baptists, amen means it's time to eat. <laughs> amen. Okay. The other is, the other amen is preacher Sikkim. And of course the preachers in here is going to say amen because they want this to happen. Amen? Amen. amen? amen. Now, by the way, and you've heard me say this in days gone by, and this is not new for most of you. If amen is something that's not in your uh, vocabulary, you're a little nervous about doing that, just sort of nod your head up and down. That to me is an amen. Amen? amen. And, and I do ask you to keep your eyes open when you're nodding. <laughs> or I'm going to send Brother Charlie back there to sit by you. Amen? amen? Just nod. Amen. There you go. So we're going to talk tonight about revival. And we're going to talk about what it means to experience true revival. How to have revival. What are the elements that ought to be involved in your life that's really going to make a spiritual difference? Now, I don't want you to walk away saying, well, Brother Mark doesn't believe that we are having a spiritual change and an experience here at Finley Baptist Church. Well, if you walk away saying that, then you're right. That's what I'm saying. I want something to happen in your life that's much greater than just coming to a church service. That's going to make a difference on Monday morning. I, ha I hold that much of what happens on Sunday doesn't make a hill of beans on Monday. And consequently, because it doesn't make a difference on Monday, was it really worth it on Sunday? I want my Mondays to be better because I've been around God's people, around God's Word, allowing God through the Holy Spirit to impact my life on Sunday. I want my Mondays to be somewhat different. But until we come to a place in our lives where we can say, God, thank you for revival. Thank you for reviving me. Now, by the way, revival is for dead Christians. That's what revive means. You've either fallen asleep or you've just died to things of God. And you're no longer moved when someone talks about the Word of God or talks about what God is doing in other people's lives. You know, we take God so much for granted. Amen? I mean, we expect God just to be there. God, when I need you, show up. Now, I'm going to say something here that uh, you may not agree with, but by our attitude and actions, sometimes we may even say, God, don't show up right now because I'm busy doing some other things, and I want to do what I want to do. I don't want you to disrupt my world. Revival is disrupting your world. It is causing things to be somewhat different than what they were before revival came to you. So we're going to talk a little bit about this, and as we do so, I'm not going to tell you where I'm going to preach from just yet, but I want to give you some background information to help you to see revivals that have taken place in days gone by. As you think about revivals, there are many that have transpired over the years in our nation. In fact, as we look historically, and I've been a student of revival most of my ministerial life, I'm intrigued by the way God moves. I'm intrigued by the way God is able to stir the life of one person and that begins to stir the life of another and another and another until it sweeps across a nation and then begins to go into other nations. That's what real revival does. It does not settle itself just with you. But what it does when it comes into your life, it begins to transform your life and that has an impact upon other people's lives around you as well. You can write these down. This is just for a little tidbit. The past revivals in our nation started in 1725 
Now I'm just going to give you several dates. You jot them down if you'd like. In 1725, before the Revolutionary War started, there was a great revival that broke out in our nation. Right after the Revolutionary War in 1792, and then in 1830, there was another one in 1857, 1882, 1904, and then the last one in our country was in 1948. Now, I wanted you to hear that one for sure. Did you get it? The last revival that took place in our nation, according to historians, biblical historians, church historians, was 1948. What that means is in our lifetime, we've not had real revival. We've had a lot of meetings. We've paid for a lot of evangelists to come into town, but we've not had a moving to the Holy Spirit. I want to have a moving to the Holy Spirit. By the way, it's happening in some other countries. I'm not here to talk about missions, but if we were to get into some conversations about Africa, it may be the next great awakening that's taking place is going to be in Africa, not in the United States. Oh, I am sad about that. It ought to be happening here. My uh, favorite time in studying revivals is the 1857 revival movement. That, is, that period of time is just so intriguing to me. But in 1857, on September the 23rd, a man went into an upper room in Manhattan, New York, Jeremiah Lampier, and he began what was called a layman's prayer meeting. He had put flyers throughout New York and said, come pray with us. On that first meeting, only a handful of people showed up but halfway through that hour of prayer, according to Jeremiah's testimony, they began to hear footsteps on the stairwell coming up. And all of a sudden, the room was filled with people and they began to pray. As God began to move as a result of that prayer meeting, not long afterwards, by March of 1858, every church, every open building was filled with people on their face before God. It had transpired not only in the city of New York, but every major city in our country. They were having prayer meetings. Businesses would close down, and they would gather for prayer. Signs were put up in the windows, closed for prayer meetings. Then it began to sweep other nations. It went across the pond in all the great Britain nations. South Africa began to experience revival. Brazil, Central America began to experience revival. God was moving during this period of time. Little did Lampier know that this nation itself was about to go through some hard times. In September on the 23rd when they began this, when he began this, in October there was a panic, a bank panic. Financial system in our nation began to go bankrupt. There was division within our country. You all remember some of those divisions. In fact, in 1861, our nation was at war with itself. Little did he know at that moment how desperately we were needing revival. But God began to move throughout our country because one man said, I'm going to get serious with God. And I'm going to spend time on my face before God until God does something. I wonder what it would be like if we came to that point in our life. That we're going to pray until God does something. I'm not talking about a light general prayer. I'm talking about scheduling time where we can be on our face before God, crying out to Him over the condition not of our country, but the condition of our own lives. The apathy that we have grown to have in our hearts about God. That we would say, I'm going to church, but listen, it's going to be different for my life on Mondays and the rest of the week as well. This revival of 1857-58 produced some great men of God. Charles Finney was, Finney was preaching much during that period of time. You will find as you study through this, D.L. Moody surrendered to preach during these days. By the way, I like D.L. Moody. He didn't go to seminary. 
He was uneducated. I read a book by his son, and it said in that book about his father, he was just a shoe salesman. Cindy and I have been to the place in Boston. Boston. It's got a placard on the building, the place where Dale Moody worked. He was fitting a, a, a lady in shoes, and two men were standing over to the side, and they were saying something like this, according to his son. This world has not yet seen what God could do with one man completely sold out to Jesus. And it was that moment in time as his son put in a book and said, D.O. Moody looked up and said, I'll be that man. It's proclaimed about Moody that he won personally over a million people to Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. Isn't that cool? Amen. But let me add something very candidly. I wonder tonight, has this world seen one church that is completely sold out to Jesus? Can we become a people of God that we're going to make Jesus the top priority instead of just another event on our busy schedules? Not only did Dill Moody come out of this, William and Catherine Booth, y'all may or may not have heard that name, those names. Salvation Army is one that you've heard, right? It came out of this period of time. Andrew Murray, every preacher knows about Andrew Murray. What a great theologian he was. And devotional, if you ever read any of his devotion. Oh, it's just so moving. He said, Brother Mark, what are you saying to us? What I'm saying is this. It's happened before on many occasions. Can it happen again? Okay, let me help us all for just a minute. It has happened before. And if God has done it before, can God do it again? Amen. Is it only limited to, forgive me for this, but hear it again, 1725, 1792, 1830, 1857, 1882, 1904, and 1948. Is, is God finished? Can we not say to God, here I am, God. I'm going to let it start with me. Now, we don't have time because Brother Charlie's put a time limit on me. But if we were to take time this evening for me to review all of these dates, you will find that every single revival that ever broke out started with somebody praying. Not just a simple prayer, but became very serious with God and prayed for a long period of time for God to move. Are you ready for that? It's called revival tonight. Are you ready for God to truly do something that is unmistakable, Jesus Christ? But only you can answer that question for yourself. But if you truly are ready, what a wonderful night this is going to be. Because not only will it make a difference in your life tonight, but it's going to make a difference in your world tomorrow and the world for others as well. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of the Revelation. We're going to be in chapter 2 tonight. <clears throat> as you take opportunity to read through the book of the Revelation, by the way, if you don't know where this is in the Bible, it's the last book in the Bible. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, you will find there's seven letters to seven churches. Every preacher ought to study these two chapters intently. You're going to find in these two chapters how Satan attacks the church and then what God's intent is for the fellowship of believers to be able to serve him. And so I'm going to take two verses out of a particular section of Scripture tonight and I'm going to show you the formula for having revival. And I hope you'll not only take notes but mark it up in your Scriptures and then I hope that you'll commit it to your heart this evening. The Bible says... In Revelation chapter 2, verse number 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Now, are you getting that first part there? Here is Jesus talking. If you didn't recognize this, it's red-lettered in your Bibles. That means it's not John saying this, it's Jesus saying this. And Jesus is saying about the church, I've got something against you. I wonder what God would say about this fellowship of believers. I wonder if he would say, 
I've got something against you. You've done a lot of good things, but there's one area that you're lacking. The Bible, let me read on. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Look at verse number 5. We'll spend a lot of our time on verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Father, we thank you for our time tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would stir our hearts, help us to understand what you're wanting to do and how you're going to do this. The Lord, find us as faithful believers to serve you. Father, you know what's needed in my life, in the life of every person at the sound of my voice tonight. This church, thy will be done. Father, we surrender. I surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen. As you read through uh, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, again, as I said just a moment ago, it's seven letters to seven churches. Those seven churches were literal churches. As John is hearing from Jesus and writing things down, these are genuine letters to seven churches that existed. And by the way, none of them exist today. They've all gone by the wayside. And all of them fell by the wayside as a result of what Jesus said about them in these two chapters. As you read these two chapters, you not only will see seven literal churches and seven letters to those individual churches, but you're going to find information about every church within those seven letters. And not only the information about each of those churches, you will also discover how Satan attacks the church in each of these letters. And I'm going to give you several of them tonight. So as we work our way through this, see what the devil is wanting to do, but understand fully what God is planning to do with each of our lives. You'll notice in the context before us that the church of Ephesus was a church that John was a pastor there for some time. Not only John, but Timothy was a pastor. Remember, John gets thrown on the Isle of Patmos, and so someone else had to spend time leading the church, and Timothy was a young preacher at that time, and he was that one that helped to lead this this fellowship. It's called the Church of Ephesus. Ephesus was a wicked city. This church was facing great opposition. There was false worship going on. The goddess Diana was there, multi-breasted idol. There were sexual orgies that would happen all around that idol. It was something that was of every degradation you could begin to think of was happening in the city of Ephesus. Their moral compass was thrown away. There was no more morality. Kind of sounds like our country right now where the moral compass has been thrown away and we have lost our way as a nation. But may I just add something real quickly. As the church goes, so does the nation. You didn't get it. Some on this side got it, so let me do it again over here. You see, we can't blame Washington on our dilemmas. The blame does not rest by who is in the political office today. The blame is right here with us, and we need to fully understand that. Here is Ephesus. Go and read this about Ephesus in verse number 1, and you will see they're doing some wonderful things for Jesus. And then you come to verse 4 and you'll see the problem that prevents revival right here. And Jesus says, all that was good, but I've got something against you. There's something that is going on in your life that stands in the way of me blessing you. So if you're taking notes tonight, let me kind of go through an array of things before we go to verse 5. How does Satan attack the church? Number one, you will find that Satan works for the church to lose their first love. Gets us sidetracked, gets our eyes off what's really important. To put our eyes upon ourselves, on what our needs are. Put our eyes on the things that we may desire in life. Our schedule, if you will. You know how I know that this church needs revival? You say, bro, you hear a lot. You preach to us a bunch. 
So it hadn't worked so far. I'm not laughing. You know how I can tell? I said it to the church today because it was true for them and it's true for you. Your preachers get up here and preach to more empty pews than filled pews. If you were really walking with Jesus, this church would be packed. It's not your preacher's fault. It's all of our faults. Amen? Amen. We lost our first love. Jesus is important, but only to a point. We put qualifications on Jesus. We put boundaries on Him. I will do this, but I'm not willing to step out of my comfort zone. Secondly, in Revelation 2.10, they were crumbled under persecution. A lot of preachers do this. They get somebody in church that gets a little upset, and so the preacher changes the way he preaches because he doesn't want to make anybody mad. Did you know that you can't read the Bible very much, very long, without getting a little upset about what the Bible's saying? I'm glad it's God's Word and not Mark's Word. So now I can blame God instead of taking the blame. Persecution. A lot of preachers are persecuted. I'm thankful for the 38 years that uh, Brother Charlie's been here. Is that 38 years? Amen. A lot of preachers don't make it. They tell us about 1,500 preachers leave the ministry every month. You think we've crumbled under persecution? Thirdly, the, to love worldliness. Satan wants us to fall in love with the world. Listen, Israel was led to marry pagan women in the Old Testament. The church has been led to marry the world. And we want to look more like the world so that we can attract the world to come into our place and hear about Jesus. Did you know that Jesus never preached a single sermon to attract the world? When you read through the gospel, start with Matthew, go to Mark. How about Luke and most certainly John? Every sermon Jesus preached, he was doing this. He was not doing this. He put roadblocks up. Go bury the dead, then let the dead bury the dead. You don't have a place to sleep? Come and see where I sleep. Every sermon, he put barriers up. Think about it. Today in church, we've got to do all these things so that the world will say, y'all are okay. And so we begin to have worldly things going on. And those worldly things become more important than what God wants to do in our lives. It's Revelation 2, 14 and 15, by the way. Revelation 2, 20. The devil wants you to move away from true doctrine. Doctrine is important. Look up here. Write that down. Look up here. This is God's Word. And we ought to know what God's Word says. Not just it says somewhere in the Bible. We ought to know where in the Bible it says that. We ought to know God's Word. Too many churches today have moved so far away from biblical doctrine, they don't even know what doctrine is. If I were to give you a test tonight, and I'm not yet, what are the nine major doctrines that the Bible teaches us about? Okay, we got room to grow, don't we? Doctrine. Revelation 3, 1, the devil wants you to focus on your past successes. I preach in a lot of churches and I've heard, you know, well, we used to be this kind of church. This is what's happened. We've seen God do, and they just fill in the blank. So we rest on our laurels about what God did yesterday rather than what God wants to do today. You see, I'm, I, I love the stories of yesterday, but listen, I'm more interested in what God's doing today, and maybe what He does today will influence my tomorrows. 
Revelation 3, 15 and 16 to move away from your purpose. What is the purpose of Finley Baptist Church? The purpose of Finley Baptist Church is win the lost, disciple the new saved, and to go do it again. You say, well, now our purpose is to glorify God. Did you know the best way to glorify God is to tell people about Jesus? In fact, tell me something greater to do in glorifying God than telling people about Jesus. I want to start doing that too. Amen? You see, that's where the start is for all of us as a fellow of believers. Everything that we do ought to be to begin to be able to share the gospel with others around us. The last one, Revelation 3, 17, the devil wants you to become self-dependent rather than being dependent upon God. He wants you to look at what we can do. Most people are already self-dependent. Most get up in the mornings, get themselves ready, go off to their jobs and never spend a moment to say a word to God. Self-dependent. A lot of churches have become this way where they really don't need God to do anything. They've got enough people, enough offerings. They, they can take care of themselves. God, we appreciate you, but here's what we're going to do. Self de, self-dependent. Now, I wanted you to hear this because it comes right out of the seven letters. There's seven points out of seven letters. Here's what Satan does to attack the church. Has he attacked Finley Baptist in any one of these areas? Don't answer that. Not to me anyway, but answer it in your own heart. And if it's true in your heart that the answer is yes, then what that means is he's attacked you. And he's now dealing with you to pull you away from the truth. So how do we get this back? How do we gain what we have lost before God? Well, I'm going to give you the answers to the questions. Chapter 5, or excuse me, Number five in chapter two, you will find some things that Jesus says to the church. You ought to jot these down, maybe underline it in your Bible. One of the things I like to do when I preach is do a sermon, and I have my sermon outline, and all the words have to start with the same letter. Amen. Now that's preaching right there. Now, if you can't come up with a word that's the same letter as the rest of them, listen, you need to get back to your study. Amen. You know, everything's got to start with the same one. Well, Jesus was that way also. He's going to give us most of these words with the letter R. And that's pretty cool. Amen. I don't have to come up with the words. Jesus, you're giving us the words. Notice firstly in verse number 5, he says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Where did you move away from God? That first word ought to be in your notes, remember. Where is it that you've moved away from God? What is that point in time that took place in your life where you now are no longer having that same wonderful experience of glory of God in your life? Go back to that point. For most of you, if you'll be honest with yourself, it's going to take you back to a place, a time of sin. And when that sin entered into your life, you began to gravitate away from God. Oh, it doesn't mean you don't show up for church. It means that you don't have the same spiritual experience with God that maybe somebody else is having or maybe what you've had in days gone by. Remember, where did you begin to why off God in your life? Where is it that that change began to take place? in your life. Now, by the way, when you stop and pause and you begin to get serious with God and remember what the fault or where the fault lies in your life, God's going to bring to your attention some things you've done that you need to get right with God. I am so thankful for John, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it's not... Just saying to God, God, I sinned, so forgive me for all of my sins. That is a, a cop out before God. God is not interested in you saying all my sins. God wants you to do what we learn to sing in other respects. Count your many blessings, name them what? 
one by one. We ought to change that, count your many sins and name them one by one and tell God, here's where I messed up, God. I did it. I sinned. I did this before you. Is that not what David said in, in Psalm 51? David was that great prayer, repentance. He said, God, it's you I sinned against. Now, we know he sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba and the nation of Israel and his family, etc. But he came before God and said, God, it's you that I've sinned against. And he named his sin. We ought to do that. So the first thing is to stop and say, God, I want to remember where I messed up. Call it to my attention because I'm serious about this, God. I want to know how I've offended you. Are we okay so far? Look at this next word. The Bible says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. The next word is one that we don't like to talk much about. And it's that word, repent. Repent. Metanoia in the Greek language. Repent. A lot of preachers don't like to preach on repentance because it sort of gets them in trouble when you deal with your sins and calling it for what it is. By the way, I really like to read what Paul wrote and I like to read what John wrote. There's two places in the Bible where they both do this. Paul wrote a letter to the church of Philippi. In that letter, he gives all kinds of accolades to the church of Philippi for what the great things they were doing. And then he comes to a place and he names two women in the church and he talks about that they're not walking with Jesus because they're at odds with one another. Wouldn't you like that? Amen. Preacher's going to get up here to preach. He already knows about what's going on in the church, and he's going to call you out. Amen? Amen. By name. <laughs> Amen? Brother Charlie's saying, go ahead and do it, please. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, John does it also over there in 3 John. He calls somebody out by name. We've gotten to a point in our ministerial lives that we don't want to call people's names because we don't want to offend somebody else the Bible really is offensive if you'll read it in many respects repentance this is a change of mind about the very seat of moral action before God to say I remember Lord where it was that I deviated away from you I'm going to name my sin, I'm going to call it for what it is, and I'm going to repent from it. That means I'm not going to do it again. You didn't hear the last part of this, did you? The word repentance means to turn your back upon that which you were doing to not go back to do it all over again. How many of you all, don't answer out loud, but how many of you all have sinned, asked God to forgive you for that sin, and then you went and did it again? You never repented. You just named something to God and went through the spiritual motions, but nothing has come from that, and as a result, there's not been a repentive mo motion in your life. You see, if you want to be revived, you've got to remember where the problem started, and you've got to call it out for what it is, and you've got to repent. Get on your face before a holy God and say to God, I'm wrong, you're not, but this is what I did against you, and I'm not doing it anymore, God. I'm going to live for Jesus. Now, that means a change of lifestyle. Okay, you didn't get that part, did you? It means you can't go to some places that you used to go to. You can't watch some things on TV. Amen? I mean, you'll find me something that's good on TV besides gun smoke. Amen? It don't get much gooder. I was telling somebody, I think just a while ago, wouldn't it be great if people got to Andy Griffith and watch Gunsmoke instead of all this other nonsense that's out there today? You can't hardly turn your TV on unless it draws you right into sin. By the way, you ought to read Romans 1 because it talks about all those sins, homosexuality, etc., all the way through Romans 1. And then down at the bottom of that chapter, chapter number 1, it says, and them 
that enjoy watching it. You know what that means? You're just as guilty watching it as those that are doing it. Repent. Why do we not have, and I grew up this way. This is an old-fashioned altar right here. I grew up, you know, preacher gives a good sermon. The invitation is given and people flood the altar. Why are we not all on our face before God right now? And says, oh God, I've sinned against you. And if you're going to do something in my life, it's got to start right here. And God, no matter what you do, you need to hear from me. I repent of my sins. I'm turning away from it. And I'm going to strive to live my life for the glory of God. Remember, repent. The third one here, and Jesus messed up right here, and he did not give me an R word. So I had to give him one. The Bible says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, repent. And then it says, and do the first works. And I wrote the word down in my notes, return. To get back to serving God. To get back doing those things that will bring honor and glory through your life to Almighty God. You see, until we get busy for Jesus, we'll never really experience that revival but we need to say to God, I surrender. Look up here, you see this? I surrender. This is universal. Put your hands up. What did Paul say to young Timothy in 1 Timothy? I would that men pray everywhere with uplifted hands. It's okay, Baptists, to raise your hands. I know it's tough for some of you to raise your hands. Okay, it's really tough for everybody but one of y'all. God, I raise my hands before you. I surrender. I'll do anything you want me to do, go anywhere you want me to go. I'm going to honor Jesus with my life. I lay it all out before you, Lord. I'm going to do what you told me to do. I can't undo missing time in the past, but I'm going to make sure I do it today. Because I want the name of Jesus to be high and lifted up in my life. We need to return. Return to serving God. Get busy doing that which God said for you to do. Hear me carefully. Every one of you in this room has been called by God to go do something for His glory. Every one of you. There are three callings that all believers get. Number one is called to be saved. John 6, 44. Called to serve and then called to go home. That which happens between number one and number three is what we ought to be doing for the glory of God. What is your purpose in life? And whatever that is, get busy doing that for the glory of God. God will do a work in your life that is unmistakable, Jesus Christ. That means that you won't be able to look back and what's going on and say, look at what I did, but you'll look back and say, look what God is doing. Look how God is leading I mean, I've stood before you and told you stories of how God has moved in our lives and we're seeing a wonderful work take place around the world with churches being started and how God has protected and taken care of us through genocides and all those things. But listen, that only comes because at some point in time you've got to be sold out to Jesus. God uses sold out people. My favorite, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, by the way, they all are my favorite. But in this vein, one of my favorites found on the book of Luke, chapter number 5. Y'all know the story. Nod your head down, please. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus is preaching on the seashores of Galilee. My wife, just a couple years ago, my wife and I were on the Sea of Galilee. It's not a big spot where he was preaching. There were some men out there washing some nets. You know this story now, don't you? The crowd was so thick and pressing on him, he's sort of standing out in the water and uh, he's trying to preach. And then he looks over to Peter and said, let me get on your boat for a minute. And he does so and he begins to preach. And now he's elevated up a little bit so everybody in the back can hear him. Then he says to Peter, cast out a little ways. And Peter does so. And then he says to Peter, put down your nets. Now, you know the story about Peter. Peter was a what? Fisherman. And so here's what Peter said. It's not in your Bibles. Here's what Peter said. 
I are a fisherman, you are a carpenter. You let me decide about the fishing and you decide about the building. Amen? You read it there, right? Amen? And um, as he's talking to Peter and Peter's responding back to him, he says, we've done this all night. Now everybody under the sun knows that you don't go fishing the heat of the day. Even I know that. You go when it's the sun is down. But at your word, we will let down our nets. And you remember the story, what happened. They began to draw in a host of fish. It was so much so that the boat began to sink. I've watched this in the Amazon. When they've cast the nets, they're drawing fish in. It's a wonderful thing. If you ever like to see it, get on my Facebook page. I've got the video there. But finally, Peter says to their brethren, James and John, come help us. We're about to sink. we got too many fish. Verse number 11 is the key to this passage. When all that took place, they came back to the shore. The Bible says, Peter fell down at the feet of Jesus. Then he forsook all and followed him. You think Peter just had revival? He saw what was really important in his life. It wasn't fishing. That was his job. I mean, that was his calling with his family to go fish. And Jesus said to him, you'll no longer be fisher of fish, but now fisher of men. Dear church family, what are you willing to forsake to have God do, do something special in your life? What is it that you're willing to say to God, I'm going to give this up for you to move in my heart to do something that I just can't believe that God did this. Look how wonderful of a Savior we have. He does give us a word of caution for the church and it's that last word that you ought to jot down and it's the word remove. Jesus says, if you don't do this, we're going to remove the pastor. By the way, they did not, and consequently, the church of Ephesus died. It is no longer in existence today because the church did not repent. And because they did not repent, Jesus said, I'm going to move the, look at it, the candlestick, which we know is referring to the pastor of the church, out of the way, and you're going to fail. There's a church here in Dyer County no longer here by the way but I remember the Sunday morning that the preacher got up behind the pulpit he was sort of a new guy and he stood up and I remember just like it was yesterday he held up a copy of God's word and he said to the congregation this is not God's word it only contains a little bit of God what God said that church is no longer in existence today it has died a church that at one time was packed with every pew being filled with people. I was saved in that church. We got others in this church right now that attended over there, but they no longer exist because one day God took the candlestick and moved it out of the way because they failed to do what Jesus said. I don't know how long this church has been here, can this church go away? It can. If we're not willing to say to God, I'm going to surrender. I'm going to repent. I remember where I messed up. I'm going to name it for what it is. I'm going to repent from that. And I want the moving of the Holy Spirit to take place. And I'm getting busy serving God. God is just waiting for anyone to sell out to God completely. God is looking for that body of believers that would say, that those folks must be serious about me, so I'm going to bless them. He's waiting for you to respond. But I wonder if you will. I wonder if we're just having a good time. I drove a long way for you to have a good time, by the way. And so why don't we just do something for Jesus? Amen? You say, what is it that God can do? I don't know. 
but I'm willing to find out. I remember the very day in my life, walking home from school. Y'all know we are from here, so you understand this. We had to walk uphill for six miles in several feet of snow and uphill going home. Y'all remember that, right? Yeah. When I tell people in Florida about this, they don't have a clue. What do you mean? What is snow to begin with? But I was walking home one time, and, and usually the folks that I grew up with on our street would all kind of walk home together, but for that day, I was all alone. Our church had just had a youth revival, and we had been down to Memphis at the Coliseum, and, and I heard some great preaching, and I remember getting up out of my seat, walking down the aisle, and getting on my face and telling God, you know, I'm here. But as I was thinking about that on a Monday, walking home, I'm now at near what used to be, some of y'all won't remember this maybe, the younger folks, but the older folks will. Y'all know where the cotton mill was? There's some railroad tracks right there. Y'all remember those? I remember stopping right before the railroad tracks before I crossed over to walk through the back part of Jeannie Bell School, which is no longer there. I remember stopping, looking up to heaven, pointing my finger to God, and I said something like this. God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go in the world. Tell anybody you want me to tell about Jesus, and I will honor you. Little did I know that God will literally take me serious and allow me to go around the world to tell people about Jesus. Now, I'm not saying for you to say, man, way to go, preacher. What I'm saying is, all you got to do is say yes to God. Now, does that mean you got to get on a, a plane and go to Africa? Yeah, it means that. No, no, no. But if you want to go, it would be a great thing. But what that means is, God, I want to find out what your purpose for my life is right here. And whatever it is, I'm, I'm in. You don't have to ask twice. I'm in, God. I'm willing to serve you. But before all that happens, we've got to deal with sin. Some of y'all got sin in your life that you've tucked away. Some of y'all got things that you've done when you were growing up that you've not dealt with yet. Maybe even as an adult, you've done some things. It's high time for us to get on our face before God and just ask God, what is it that stands in the way of you doing something that is unmistakable Jesus in my life? And whatever God brings to your memory, deal with it so that God can use a clean life for His glory. Revival is not supposed to be just a series of meetings. Y'all have had two already, and this is the third, I think, right? I tell preachers when I am preaching revival, we'll see if this works or not. I preached revival here two or three years ago. I guess I ought to give the money back. Amen. Now listen, until we decide it's going to start with me, it's not going to ever change Washington, D.C. It's not going to change Tallahassee, Florida, where I live. I don't live in Tallahassee, but our capital is there. It's not going to change Nashville, Tennessee. It's not going to change the government of Dyer County. I'm not looking for God to do something over yonder. I'm looking for God to do something right here. I'm not looking for God to do anything with you. I want God to do something right here. You see, it doesn't start with you. It starts with me. You can say the same about yourself, by the way. You can say, preacher, it doesn't start with you. It doesn't start with our pastors. It starts with me. And so I'm going to get serious with God. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. Some of you all will say yes to God, and you'll respond to Him. Not to me, please, but you're going to respond to the Lord. Some of you are going to say no to God, and you're going to walk out of this place, say, well, great to have Davis here. See what happens Sunday. Now, you wouldn't really say that, but by our lives we may. But the choice really falls in your lap now. One of the things I enjoy about preaching, it gets it off my shoulders and puts it on yours. I've already dealt with this. I've already gone through this before I could ever stand in this pulpit to preach this sermon. So now it's up to you to decide what are you going to do about it. Is it going to be the same as it always has been are you tired of the way that it has been and you're ready for something fresh and new from God? God doesn't do things by force. 
He puts it out there in front of you. My theological belief is this. He leaves it with you to decide how you're going to be. So how will you be tonight? How's it going to be when all this is over with? Am I going to get a text from Brother Charlie and says, God is moving in our church. Brother Trevor's preaching like, man, we've never heard sermons before. What a wonderful sermon. My brother would call and say, listen, what God is doing at Finley Baptist Church, only God could be doing that. Are we just going to finish tonight? Maybe some of you will make it back on Wednesday. Then on Sunday, we'll come back again and have some good songs and get a good sermon. Nothing really changes. Nobody is saved. No lives are impacted. I wonder the way it's, how it's going to be for you. What are you willing to do? I look around the room and I know that some of you are my age. I just debated with someone this little while ago about who's older, her or me. And I said, no, I am way older than you, even though we graduated at the same time. And then somebody had some nonsense to say, well, how many grades did you fail? And I said, well, <laughs> enough to be older than her, that's for sure. Uh, but some of you are a day or two older than me. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, I've done my time. And I'm wondering in my mind, how long have you been locked up? It's time to get out of prison and get back to serving God. You know what I found about you old people? I mean, all the... And God's not finished yet. You know, when He is finished with you, one of these guys, is going to preach your funeral. It's over. And until you got breath in your body, God still has a plan and something for you to do. And what God wants you to do to begin this process is to come before God and say, God, I've sinned against you. I am repenting of my sin. Get on my face before God and have a brokenness of my spirit and repent of the sins in my life and get back to doing what God's called me to do, whatever that call may be, that the name of Jesus can be high and lifted up once again. And until you come to that point in your life, we're just going to have a series of meetings that won't mount a hill of beans. But God's still waiting in the shadows for us to say yes to Him. So as I come to a, f a final thought here tonight, now I'll close my Bible doesn't mean I'm finished. I memorized my sermon, so I've got about another hour. Now listen carefully. Are you really ready for revival? Are you ready to pay the price for what God wants to do in your life? Are you tired of sin? And I know that, whether you, that if you're going to be tired of it or not, but what you talk about, what you see, and what you do, that tells us a lot about your condition before God. What is it in your life that you're willing to get rid of for God to work in you to do something that is unmistakable, Jesus Christ. That means I can't take credit. Your preachers can't, nor can you, but only to be able to say to God, look at what a great God we have today. And I'm so thankful that God is still using our life. It's not too late. Revival can come. And when the revival comes, your preachers will not be preaching to empty pews. It's going to be a question is how can we get everybody in here? Are you getting the picture yet? These are the words of Jesus, by the way. He gave the church of Ephesus, what is it that you need to do to get back to where you ought to be? Very plain, very clear in our thinking. And the application, the church of Ephesus is the application to every church in the world today. Here's what we need to be doing. And once we get there, God goes to work. We've got churches in Africa right now that they're bursting through the seams because they've taken what we've shared tonight at heart. 
and they're growing. People are being saved. I think they baptized about a month or so ago, 72 people one morning, ordained like 40, 50 men for gospel ministry. That's cooler than cool, amen? Why can't we do that? Well, until we decide we're going to have revival, we'll never be able to see that happen in our church tonight. So just one more time, go back through this with you. Do you remember where you got off track with, with God? Sin that's in your life? Are you willing to repent of that sin? Are you willing to get back, to, get, to return to what God's called you to do and serve Him? With a great deal of caution, He may just remove me out of the way. And I'm no longer ever going to be usable for God. Don't test God. Don't tell God we're going to have revival and you not respond. God will bring discipline. There are four ways God disciplines His people. Maybe one day I'll get to come back and I'll preach on dis the disciplinary action of God. You ought to know what that is. But it starts with you today. It doesn't start with a whole church doing something. It starts with you individually. And I'm just going to say very openly... This altar is available for you. Pastor's going to be down front. You want to come take him by the hand and talk with him? He gets busy. There's another pastor here. Whoever wants to be down front, he'll, the other will be there. If it gets really busy, I'm here. Love to be able to pray with you and talk with you about what God needs to do in your life. But you don't have to go home wondering. You can make it as a point in your life tonight. And mark it down. Mark it in your calendar. October 17th, God moved at Finley Baptist Church. And it was because we repented of sin and the Holy Spirit was able to use our lives. Father, I thank you for what you're going to do. I pray, Father, that you will stir our hearts, stir our lives. God, I pray that you will stir up things so much in this church that the people of this congregation will see their need to repent of sin, to return to, the, to you, Father. But Lord, with great caution that this church will outlive all of us. So, Father, tonight, folks are going to decide yes or no to you. They're going to make that obvious. It's all going to be up to you, Father, to move in our hearts. But it's up to us to answer the call that you're burdening us with. So, Father, touch lives even as only you can do. With heads bowed and eyes closed just for a moment, you hear the music softly playing. Firstly, let me just say to you, if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, tonight will be a great night to be saved. If that's you tonight, would you just call out to Jesus? Invite Jesus to come into your heart, to be able to say to him, you're now the Lord of my life. But you may be here also and you say, Brother Mark, I have been so far away.